despite scientific and health evidence indicating the callous recklessness and self-exculpation of such a decision, with deadly consequences for children and especially for girls. Following the Fukushima nuclear disaster, the Japanese government raised the level of allowable radiation exposure from 1 to 20 millisieverts per year, even for children. On April 19th, the Ministry of Education, Culture, Sports, Science, and Technology announced that the amount of radiation a child can be exposed to in one year is 20 millisieverts. Officials proclaim that 20 millisieverts per year is safe, but is it? We'll test the official claim of safety against established radiobiological science, the same science upon which the United States National Academy of Sciences predicts that 20 millisieverts of radiation will not only cause cancers all across Fukushima, but will primarily kill women and children. We'll also test the official claim of safety against recently published research, such as the largest study of nuclear workers ever conducted, comprising over 400,000 workers from 15 countries. The study found increased cancer mortality among nuclear workers exposed to an average of 2 millisieverts per year. That's just one-tenth of the allegedly safe 20 millisieverts per year allowed in Fukushima. We'll see that the public is being misled by governments and major media into a false sense of safety regarding nuclear fallout, obstructing the ability of citizens to be fully informed so that we can make sound decisions that direct our democracies to safe energy futures. So stay tuned as we cover all that and more. The United States National Academy of Sciences is a logical resource to consult about the state of radiation science. And the Academy regularly publishes reports on low-dose radiation risks. The reports are based on decades of epidemiological and radiobiological research from which risk-predicting models are built. The Academy's most recent report provides both raw data and instructions so that you can apply their risk models to a wide range of exposure scenarios. We can therefore find the cancer risk of 20 millisieverts. This is the Academy's data table for estimated cancer cases caused by 100 millisieverts of radiation, stratified by age and segregated by sex. Highlighted in yellow are the predicted number of cases for all cancers per 100,000 persons. Immediately we can see that the risk of cancer uniformly decreases as age increases for both males and females. In other words, children are most vulnerable to radiation. Plotting these data yields this graph. This cancer risk graph keeps the shape irrespective of its dose. This shape is therefore the face of radiation-induced cancer risk across the human lifespan. Following the Academy's instructions on scaling the model to specific doses, the y-axis is recalibrated to the predicted cancer cases caused by the allegedly safe 20 millisieverts. And here in turn are recalibrations for 10 and for 2 millisieverts. According to the Academy, there is no harmless dose of radiation. So, obviously 20 millisieverts is not safe. But what's most remarkable is that children, and most especially girls, are the most at risk of radiation-induced cancer. In fact, girls are almost twice as vulnerable as same-aged boys. And a five-year-old girl is five times and an infant female seven times more vulnerable than a 30-year-old man. These data from the National Academy of Sciences are freely available to all major media and government officials. Yet rather than informing the public of the actual state of radiation science and the real risks of nuclear power, 
They lead us instead to believe that 20 millisieverts of radiation is either safe or its effects are a complete mystery. Residents travel to Tokyo to protest after the government loosened safety limits, despite the fact the long-term impact of low-dose radiation is unknown. The long-term impact of low-dose radiation is unknown. Even worse than a failure to inform, major media lead the public to believe that scientific models of low-dose radiation risk, such as we've just reviewed, don't even exist. Yet outside the media's cocoon of blissful ignorance, science marches forward, further characterizing the risks of low-dose radiation. And the flow of incoming evidence, published since the Academy's last report in 2006, suggests that the Academy's risk model is either accurate or may underestimate risk. In 2007, the largest study ever conducted on occupational low-dose radiation exposure was published. The study contained over 400,000 nuclear industry workers from 15 countries. The study found a significant relation between radiation dose and cancer mortality. The average period of nuclear worker employment in the study was 10.5 years and the average dose accumulated over those years was 19.4 millisieverts. This implies an average annual dose of 1.85 millisieverts per year. To get a more accurate estimate of the average annual dose, this data table showing the average cumulative dose and years of employment for each country is useful. From these data, we find that the average annual dose for the whole cohort was 1.95 millisieverts per year, rounding off to 2 millisieverts per year. The data provided by the study also allow calculation of the median annual dose of the whole cohort, which was lower still, at merely 0 0.45 or one half of a millisievert per year. So the representative dose rate among the nuclear workers in the study was at most one-tenth of the 20 millisieverts per year allowed in Fukushima. So with an allowance of 20 millisieverts per year, Fukushima children may receive up to 10 times the dose rate associated with increased cancer among adult nuclear workers. To get a sense of the distribution of exposures over the cohort, 90% of the workers in the study received cumulative doses under 50 millisieverts over their entire period of employment, which overall was 10.5 years on average. So dividing 50 millisieverts by 10.5 years suggests that the dose rate for most of the workers was probably below 5 millisieverts per year which is just one-fourth of the maximum annual dose for Fukushimans. To get a sense of the distribution of the radiation effect over the 15-country cohort, the authors eliminated each country from the study one at a time to see if eliminating one country's data eliminated the indicated radiation effect. In each sub-analysis, they found that the excess risk ratio, or ERR, was higher than, but compatible with, the National Academy of Sciences BEER-7 risk model, which was the risk model we previously reviewed. So the indicated radiation effect was not biased by data from any particular country. The authors of the study noted that worker smoking is a possible confounding factor, since lung cancer was common among the workers. However, other smoking-associated cancers showed little relation to radiation dose, and the authors concluded that even if smoking played a role, it cannot fully account for the dose relation of cancer to radiation. So let's recap. The 15-country study, authored by 51 radiation scientists, 
is the largest study ever conducted of nuclear workers. It found increased cancer risk among the workers. The average worker dose was two millisieverts per year. Most workers received under five millisieverts per year. And the maximum dose allowed in Japan is twenty millisieverts per year. That's ten times higher than the average annual worker dose, and four times higher than most worker doses. Two years later, in 2009, Jacob and colleagues analyzed the 15-country study we just reviewed, plus eight other nuclear worker studies. What makes nuclear worker exposure especially relevant to areas contaminated by nuclear fallout? Is that both exposure scenarios deliver doses at a slow, persistent rate, and the meta-analysis of Jacob and colleagues suggests that such slow dose rates might be more harmful than fast dose rates. For example, this chart from Jacob et al. shows excess cancer mortality risk found in nine studies of nuclear workers. Each study is denoted by a red dot whose rightward displacement from zero risk along the bottom axis denotes the degree of increased risk found in that study. In contrast, the blue dots represent the comparative excess risk among the atom bomb survivor cohort, adjusted to match the sex ratio and average age of the nuclear workers in each study. As we can see, the red dots are usually more rightward displaced than the blue dots, and therefore most nuclear worker studies found a higher risk of cancer mortality than among atom bomb survivors. This is a significant finding because radiation risk models are largely founded upon fast dose exposures, like from the atomic bomb blasts, and it has been assumed that fast dose rates. Were more harmful. However, the findings of Jacob and colleagues brings this view into question. As an editorial on the findings of Jacob et al. in the journal Occupation and Environmental Medicine observed, quote, "A number of recent studies challenge the assumption that low dose rate exposures to penetrating forms of ionizing radiation." Are less effective at causing cancer than high dose rate exposures, because risk estimates for people who received low dose rate exposures tend to be larger than or similar to the corresponding estimates derived from the study of Japanese atomic bomb survivors. End of quote. This graph from Jacob et al. Demonstrates the discrepancy of risk models. The two leading risk models are on the left. The second is the National Academy of Sciences cancer risk model we examined previously. Both risk models are based largely on the fast dose rate exposure experienced by atomic bomb survivors. But the third bar on the right represents the higher level of risk derived from the slow dose rate. Experienced by nuclear workers. So the cutting edge of meta-analytical research suggests that the leading contemporary radiation risk models may actually underestimate the carcinogenic efficiency of low-dose radiation. Science is not only further clarifying the harmful effects of low-dose radiation on large-scale macroscopic levels. But on the microscopic level as well, recent research has increased the fidelity of data in the low-dose range regarding radiation-induced genetic damage. Chromosomal translocations are a form of genetic damage resulting from the faulty repair of DNA molecules damaged by genotoxic chemicals or radiation. Chromosomal translocations, also known as chromosomal aberrations, are believed to result in many forms of cancer, 